Holy crap! It's another great episode from Mind Pump. You're going to like this episode because we talk about perhaps the crash of the economy that's coming in 2021 with a great economist, Peter Lindman. You're going to like this episode. Also, we're going to give away a free program because that's what we do. We're very giving people. Today's giveaway is Map Strong. Here's how you can get free access to Map Strong. Leave a comment in the first 24 hours, and if we like your comment, if we pick your comment as the best comment of all the comments, you get free access to Map Strong. Also, subscribe to this channel and turn on your notifications. One more thing, we are running a sale this month. Maps Prime, Maps Prime Pro, and the Prime Bundle, all 50% off. Go check those out at mapsfitnessproducts.com. Just don't forget to use the code June Prime. For the discount. All right, enjoy this podcast. Uh, so, Peter, with, with the way we'll do this, it's a very conversationalist between all of us. Um, I'll give you a little okay. uh, little background. Well, although we're a health and fitness podcast, uh, we, we talk about financial health all the time. Uh, we've had, yes, we had uh, Peter Schiff on here a few months back. And so we've, we've had economists come on here and talk. And uh, one of the things that uh, I loved about you. I found you on the the Walker webcast a little over a year ago, so that's yeah. how that's how I came across your content. And one of the things that that drew me in about your content was uh, a lot of times when I listen to economists talk about stuff, I, they I feel like they're very biased or they have an agenda, whether they're trying to sell gold or they have a political agenda. Huh. And uh, and you, I don't know, you can argue or debate that, but I, I feel that you do not come off that way. I feel like you're very non-biased, and so I, I wanted to introduce you to our audience. Well, that's nice of you to say. I, I have this funny thing. I'm 70 years old, and my career is typified by Democrats are convinced I'm a Republican, and Republicans are convinced I'm a Democrat. So I think it <laughs> yeah. goes to what you're saying, and I sort of pride myself on that. None of us always succeed in being uh, free of whatever, but I try. And to your physical fitness, you know, 70 years old, I I did 80 minutes on the stationary bike this morning, lifted weights for an hour and walked 10 miles while working. Wow, wow you're doing pretty right. good. Right on, buddy. You're doing pretty good. Right and, on. Yeah, and, and, and you did some uh, work at from the Chicago school, right? So you're a, like a Milton Friedman uh, fan, yeah. if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, Milton Milton was one of my major professors back then. And I did my graduate work there, and I stayed on the faculty there a couple of years and then went to the University of Pennsylvania's Wharton School of Business in 1979. And I guess I retired from there 10 years ago. And I've since, folk, I had Lineman Associates, which is a financial advisory firm I started in 1979, and I continue doing that in my boards and my investing and my charities. So anybody interested, you could go to Linham and Associates, and you'll see about what we do and our publications and our charity and and so forth. So I st I'm that's not retired, but I'm retired from the university world. No, that's that's awesome. I mean, uh, you know, uh, Milton's uh, series "Free to Choose" had a huge impact on me, and I became a huge fan of economics uh, after that. I do want to ask you to open this up one big question. Now, I, I read recently that the majority of uh, of, of dollars, the, the the majority of money um, that exists got created recently. I don't remember what the number was, but it was something insane. Like the, when you look at the total amount of money that, we, that we've created, it was something like 90% uh, of it was made in the last uh, few years. Number one, is that true? And number two, is that a problem? Could that potentially cause problems for us? So it is absolutely true. Um, I'm now going to do numbers off the top of my head. But as um, we came to the beginning of the uh, financial crisis in very late 2008, um, the total amount of uh, what's called high-powered money or, or the money stock, or whatever you want to call it, was, and I'm doing this from memory, about $800 billion. And over the next four or five years, QE1, QE2, QE3 took it from $800 billion to about $4 trillion. That's a big jump. Oh, yeah. If you think about all of the history of the United States, took it basically from nothing 
to 800 billion and then in a matter of four years it went to 4 trillion and then um, what I call QE infinity which has happened uh, with the Fed injections associated with um, the COVID and the COVID lockdown have got it up to some number and again I'm doing off the top of my head 6 trillion so in a matter of months we grew it more than in 200 years just to put a context on it. So you're absolutely right. And again, anybody who really wants to see that figure, you can go to Lineman Letter and it's in there. It's public, it's Federal Reserve data. So Okay, so And what does it mean? So what does it mean? Good I, I, I left uh, I, I I got what it means is that money will eventually find a home. And whatever I you guys kind of the right age. You remember Beavis and Butthead? Oh, yeah. <laughs> of course. Love them. So imagine the Fed gave $4 trillion in four years to Beavis and Butthead and their friends. <laughs> Do an intellectual experiment. Oh, what would have gone idea. up in prices? What would have gone up in prices, though? And your answer would be whatever Beavis and Butthead yeah. spend money on. Beer and so metal I'm not sure stock prices would go up. I'm not sure home prices would have gone, but skateboard prices would have skyrocketed. ACDC shirts skyrocket. You got the point, right? Yeah, yeah. So in the 70s, our, when the Fed gave money to the banking system of that time, it was very fragmented by today's standards. And they gave thousands of dollars to millions of people to buy bread and Coca-Cola and a car and so forth. And by the way, when they created money, it chased those. And that's where you saw most of the inflation. What happened in the financial crisis and after, really after, they gave the money to the big banks and the big banks lent money mostly to asset buyers, either homeowners, right? That's an asset buyer or uh corporations to buy other corporations or to buy stock, people to buy stocks or bonds or gold or whatever. So what we saw from 2009 to 2019 was that money as it came out didn't chase goods and services so much. It chased assets. So the price of homes went up big time, the price of stocks went up big time, price of bonds, price of gold, you, at real estate, and so forth. So now you say, okay, they put a whole bunch more money into the system. Ask the Beavis and Butthead question. What are those banks going to lend it to? And they're going to lend it, I think, primarily to asset buyers again. Because, come on, a big, big bank is set up to lend in big ways not to give you guys $6, right? Now, they might give you a line of credit. They might give you a credit card loan. I'm not saying nothing, but they're set up to write a check for $80 million, $100 million, $200 million. That's So I think we're set up for another decade of moderate consumer price inflation and very high asset price inflation again. So it'll be a great time to own assets, not every day, right? But in general, it'd be a great decade to own assets again. Now, Peter, I, I've heard you say that inflation is one of the most misunderstood ideas. Can you explain what you mean by that? Yeah. Um, you mentioned Milton Friedman, and, and but the definition of inflation is the on average movement of prices in the economy. Okay, well, that includes the price of bubble gum, and that includes the price of gold, that includes the price of houses, that includes the price of stocks, that includes, you know, you name it, right? When we measure inflation simply by looking at consumer prices, which is what we tend to do because it's easy, only because it's easy. We're set up to do it. They send little checkers out to see how much bread is this week versus last week, right? They're set up to do it. Um, we're missing huge numbers of prices in the economy, namely asset prices. And so when you see no consumer and in price inflation, that doesn't mean 
no consumer prices are going up. We know medicals going up. We know universities have gone up. Those are consumers. But it also ignores asset prices have gone up. And, and we need to think more broadly. The Fed should think more broadly. They, they know this at the Fed. They just don't know what to do about it. It's like you may know you've got a kid who, who, who can't do their homework. Knowing it is one thing. Doing something about it is more challenging. Okay, so let's take a step back real quick because somebody listening uh, may, may hear what you're saying and they may think, well, what's necessarily wrong with more money? Isn't money okay? Like if someone gave me $10,000, that would be a good thing. Like, explain the difference between money connected to goods and services and money just not connected to anything, just more of it existing, but not connected to those goods and services. What's the difference between the two? Okay, so I'll take a very simple, um, I'll take two very simple examples. One, bread. If bread prices rise, the seller of bread benefits, right? And yes, their costs may be going up, so they may not benefit as much as it first appears. Who gets hurt by that inflation? The consumer, right? Right. And by the way, their wages may be going up, but not all consumers have wages. And so you can get the spirit. It's complicated in that regard. Okay, now think of asset prices. And I'll take the simplest asset price, home prices, Go up. Let's just let's just say that what it causes is inflation in home prices. The money that comes out is lent to people, and they chase a pretty fixed number of homes. Right? The the, the we have what uh, almost nine times the amount of money, and we have what twelve percent more houses. That's got to be a bit of an imbalance. So, who gets helped and who gets hurt when a lot of money? chases home prices. I got helped. Why? I already owned my home, right? I didn't live in a condo, but the same point, right? I got help because that money chased homes and bid it up. Who got hurt? The people who got hurt are the ones that didn't own homes yet and still wanted to buy them. And they just saw those homes moving out of affordability, right? They didn't have enough money for a down payment. Because as fast as they saved, home prices were rising, requiring an even bigger down payment. So the simplest way to say it is asset price inflation is a wonderful thing if you own assets and not a wonderful thing if you don't. So if you think about society, young people in general don't own assets. When I was young, I had nothing. I had just put myself through high school. I put myself through college. I had, I had net negative worth because I had borrowed a bit to go to college, right? And so asset price inflation wouldn't have helped me because I didn't own any assets. Today, asset price inflation helps me because I own some assets. I'm older. I had a time to accumulate. So if you think about it, what it does is so... How should I say? So is um, disparity, but the disparity is, interestingly, not about income, right? It's about have you accumulated assets? If you have a high income, but you spend it all, you don't have any assets to benefit from, right? So think of it that way. I'll give you a variant. The Fed's policy of very low interest rates. Who's that help? Who's that hurt? It helps anybody who wants to borrow. It hurts anybody who is saving safely, mm -hmm. safely like government bonds, bank accounts, et cetera. So I was talking the other day to an English professor who's 79 years old. She's been teaching for 51 years. She put in her money into her life savings account. And during the financial crisis, she took it all out of the stock market and put it all in CDs, okay? And for the last decade, so first of all, she did it at the bottom. Rule number one, don't panic, right? And sell at the bottom. So she sold at the bottom, 
she converted her life savings into CDs, certificates of deposits at the bank. How much interest did she get on that yeah. over the last 12 not, years? Not very Zero. much. Yeah. Zero, right? So, okay, we made it easier for somebody who was borrowing and we wiped her out because for 12 years, she's had no income on her life savings and she's terrified. So she has a decent, I mean, she has the university. She wasn't a big time university professor. She has some, you know, I don't know what she has, but nothing spectacular, right? But no income. That's frightening. And even though she had assets, they didn't appreciate because they were cash. So what's happened by all this is a lot of arbitrary young people getting hurt, people who save safe being hurt, people who borrowed a lot being helped. By the way, who's the biggest borrower in the world US, by far? U.S. government? U.S. government. Yeah. So what we've done by low interest rate policies is give money essentially free to the U.S. government. And you go, wow, we've taken and made money free, which right away is going to distort things, to one of the least efficient spenders in the world and one of the least productive spenders in the world that has to slow down growth mm -hmm. because you've made borrowing free to them is it surprising if you make borrowing free to somebody they'll try to borrow a whole lot more that's what the u.s government has done over the last decade they borrowed a whole lot more because it is basically free and because it's the U.S. government, people will buy it. Why won't people buy your debt? Your credit is not as good as the U.S. government because the U.S. government can print money to pay them off. So these deficits, yes, it has something to do with COVID. And yes, it has I'm not saying none, but you've given a profligate spender free money. That can't be a good thing. That just can't in general. That doesn't mean everything is wrong. Can't be a good thing. Okay, so so let's go back for a second to when we started this this kind of printing uh, bonanza of money. You know, this is after the financial crisis, right? Let's say we didn't do that. Let's say we left it. We didn't we didn't print tons of money. We allowed you know what some people would say for the market to correct itself. Would those consequences have been better than the ones that we may be getting in the future, or was like in other words? There, there's a risk versus reward. Did they make the right decision or was there somewhere in the middle or should they have left things alone? So my, no, we'll never know, right? We'll never know. It's like with your kid. If you hadn't told their kid they were grounded for a week, would they have been better or worse? You'll never know, right? right? You'll literally never know. It's an unknowable. And by the way, people can argue either way. I give you, all I can give you is my own view. I think the good news is, both in the financial crisis and now during COVID, the Federal Reserve learned the lesson Milton Friedman taught about the Great Depression. He and Anna Schwartz wrote the definitive book. It wasn't until the 1960s. So the Great Depression was in the 30s, and it wasn't until the 1960s the definitive book is written. And what they found was that it would have been a recession, but it became the depression because in a matter of about a year and a half, the money supply shrunk by about 35%. And what did that do? That is because they let it try to find its own bottom. And then you went out of business as a bank. Since you went out of business, you couldn't pay your depositors. Since you couldn't pay your depositors, they couldn't pay their to buy food or whatever, and it, it cascaded in a negative way. And Friedman's admonition was they should have not shrunk the money supply, and they probably should have increased it to maintain liquidity in hard times. That's what they did in the financial crisis, and that's what they did during COVID. Now, that part I fully agree with. Then you're only talking about um, how much. So I told you, I think it went from 800 billion to 4 trillion in a matter of a couple of years. 
Maybe they should have only gone to a trillion and a half. Maybe they should have gone to 1.2. No one will ever know. Should you have grounded your kid for three days or three weeks or not at all? You'll never know the right answer, the really right answer, mm -hmm. right? You'll never know. Um, what you do know is we avoided the Great Depression because we didn't let the money supply fall. And again, certainly with COVID, my gut is they went too far. That's my gut. But I'm not sure of that. And nobody has ever done a study and you can make interesting arguments. Now, what, what are the consequences of going too far? What is that? What, what should we, what should we too see? Far, yeah. Yep. Going too far amounted to you started the largest re wealth redistribution and income redistribution in the history of the United States. That's what it did because that money that went in, if they'd have given it to Beavis and Butthead, Beavis and Butthead came, became rich. They gave it largely to asset buyers. And those asset buyers and the people they bought assets from got wealthier because of that, right? Just mechanically. And that was a huge wealth transfer. And the reverse, the not the reverse, the other side of that coin is low interest rates. Transferred stunning amounts of money from people like the English professor I was talking about to borrowers and the U.S. government, and when I say the U.S. government, whatever the U.S. government spent on. So the wealth transfers that it created were staggering. And do I know that the whole social whatever you want to call of today is because of that? I don't know. I have an, a gut that a whole bunch of people think of the English professor. Right. Think of young people who can't afford a home because the asset price keeps going out of reach. Um, they're saying we're getting screwed somehow. And I don't even remember a vote. Mm. I don't even remember a debate because remember, it was done without any congressional debate. Right. It was all done by the Fed. Staggering the largest wealth wealth redistributions in history. If you'd have walked into Congress and said, we're going to redistribute $5 trillion, four or $5 trillion. Remember, GDP is only 21 trillion. I think that that would have been one of the most contentious debates in American history. It occurred with no external debate. And I think people didn't realize it happened, but they knew something happened to them. And the losers particularly realize something happened to them. One other interesting thing, the people sometimes say the really poor got hurt. And that turns out not to be true from this. You know why? The kind of permanently really poor never had any assets, never will have any assets. Mm. So the fact that assets got more expensive didn't affect them. If you don't use heroin and heroin prices go up, it doesn't affect you, mm. right? And and so the really the kind of when I say poor, I, I mean the kind of permanently low skilled, uh, low earners. They didn't have assets before. They didn't have assets after. That didn't hurt them. The ones that it really hurt were what I would call on the make young people. Right. Probably a lot of your viewers, I would bet. And they got hurt because in the normal scheme of things, they would get a promotion. They would get a kid. They would want to buy a house. Oops, I can't afford it because home prices are up. Hmm. And they got hurt. Right. So so a, a, a follow up question to that would be, you know, because you have asset inflation. So houses and, and properties are going up and getting much more expensive. But people have to rent those properties in order to live in them. Obviously, a lot of people buy these properties to live in them, but a lot of them are also investments, and you charge rent on these. And as the prices of these properties continue to go up, I would imagine rent would go up as well. Are we seeing or did we see any inflation in the cost of rent uh, that would follow along the cost of the, 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 the value of these assets? 
Great question. Uh, we saw two things, interestingly, on the rental side over the last decade. One was, absolutely, you're right, the uh, value of apartments went way up because there was just a lot more money chasing it. And by the way, rents were going up. And rents were going up. Uh, we'll come back to that. Rents were going up. But the interesting thing is values rose faster than rents went up. So it's not like rents didn't go up, but values rose even faster. Another way of saying it, the cash return of owning an apartment building actually went down. The cash return, the total return, including the fact your asset went up in value, went up. But you were getting less of it from cash, more of it from appreciation. In other words, cap rates went down. One of the things that cap rates went down, one of the remarkable sociological things of the last, um, so let's just say since 2000, um, is that we, the United States, have underproduced single family housing by any normal benchmark by three and a half to four million houses. And we've underproduced multifamily rental housing by around a half a million. And that means in the last 20 years, we've underproduced housing by about three and a half percent. And some of that is not in my backyard, right? Some of that is um, uh, values have gone up construction costs. There's a lot of complicated reasons. Um, people don't have down payments because even though if they bought the home, they'd win, they don't have a down payment to buy the home. And so we have fundamentally underproduced housing for 20 years. Is it a surprise that rents went up and home prices went up and apartment prices went up? Mm. What happened during COVID shutdown was stunning. And I got it wrong originally. In March of last year, I said, housing is going to get clobbered. People are going to try to maintain their, their lifestyle. They're going to lose their job. They're going to try to keep maintaining their lifestyle. They'll have no money. They're not going to have confidence. They're not going to buy a home. Well, what happened was their lifestyle got changed for them. So you normally still try to go to the movies. You still try to buy that nice pair of shoes for your kids. You still try to go to Disney. But since you don't have as much money, your savings go down, you scrimp. And housing is an easy one to put off for a couple of years, right? I mean, I don't need it today. What happened this time is the savings rate for somebody earning 100000 went from $7,000 a year to $33,000 a year. Wow. Now it's since come down a bit. It's down to about 14,000. So if you said over 12 months starting April last year, uh, because it bounced around a little, somebody who would normally have saved 7,000 out of 100 saved about 23,000 out of 100 Just over the course of the year. Why? Why? What were you going to spend it on? Yeah, everything you shut spend down. it on your trip to Paris? or Disney, or your Sixers tickets, or your concert tickets, or eating out, or all that got wiped out. And plus, you got distributions from the government, right? And a whole bunch of people didn't lose their job. A lot lost their job, but not everybody. Suddenly, people had down payment. Think of the following. You're saving $7,000 a year, but 4000 of that's your retirement. You can't touch it. So you're only saving $3,000 a year for a home. You want to buy a $300,000 home? You need a $30,000 down payment. That takes 10 years. Fair enough? Okay. Now imagine you're making $100,000 a year. You've already saved for five years. So you have $15,000, $3,000 a year for five years. And now you save $25,000 in a year. You have plenty of down payment after about six months. And by the way, the same thing's happening to your parents. So suddenly people said, oh, I have a down payment. I can buy a home. 
and interest rates are low. Interest rates being low didn't matter if you don't have a down payment, but it's the down payment that's the key, right? And I'll give you one more morbid, bizarre, whatever you want to call it. One of the big ways that people um, get a down payment is from their grandparents. I'm thinking of younger people, mm -hmm. right? In their 30s. They get it from their grandparents. Go back to my English professor. When interest rates were zero, she had wealth to distribute to them, but no income. So she kept telling her grandkids, sorry, sorry, sorry. If the interest rate had been 4%, she would have been able to give each of them 10, 15,000 a year for a couple of years for a down payment. And that's one of the reasons home purchases over the previous decade, 2010 to 2020, was very low. People didn't have the down payment and they didn't want to adjust their lifestyle. Suddenly their lifestyle got adjusted for them. They ran to buy homes and about 150,000 people, 70 years and old, grandma, your grandparents, died earlier by a number of years than they normally would have died. Why does that matter? Let's say a third of those 150, so 50,000, had nothing, had no money to give to their grandchildren or children. Doesn't help them at all. 50,000 of them died and left it to their spouse, right? Doesn't do anything for the grandchildren or the children. 50,000 of them left it to their two children and their four grandchildren. Divide 300,000 by six, 50,000 people suddenly were giving six people 50,000. What did a lot of those people do with that bequest? Buy a home. With money that they would have never gotten absent COVID. Hmm. And, the, and so a lot of strange things. And and the number that you use to, to prove this point is the the national savings average. Is that correct? I've heard you say that. It's staggering to me. It was, I think we, we averaged like 3 trillion or something and we're three X that, is that correct? We're like three X the normal. Yeah. We're actually closer to, yeah, about a little over three X at the moment. Um, yeah. It's thing. Now the, uh, this, this death phenomena is not about that. That's about how much I had saved by the time I was 75, I got COVID, I died, I was going to live until I was 85. Suddenly, my children and grandchildren got an inheritance, if I had anything to leave them, years earlier mm. and scrambled to buy a home. So, so Peter, uh, I want to I want to kind of go down the line of, of you know, effect and, and then consequence, right? So, property values going up, potentially rents can go up. Typically, when this starts to happen, especially when a segment of the population is having trouble affording these types of things, states and cities, but usually cities, will enact laws that control rent, right? So they say, okay, property value's going up, rent's going up, uh-oh, people can't afford it. Let's put some laws here that say you can't raise rent anymore. Um, could we potentially run into a city? And you also said that we're building far less than we had in the past. Could we potentially run into a situation where there's just a shortage of places for people to live in because, you know, rent is stuck, so nobody wants to leave. People are not investing in building new properties because of the rent control. Could we run into that in the future with this? Absolutely, and we've already seen bits of it. And in fact, a comment that was made, a very insightful comment or question, was, um, was the question about, well, why do we care if there's a whole lot of money out there? And your question underscores why. It creates all sorts of strange social stresses that get reacted to by politics. So absolutely, uh, there's no doubt that you're seeing more, um, what, political demand for rent control than you saw 15, 20 years ago. Right. Why? Because the asset prices are going up faster than income prices, even for well-paid millennials, right? Even for well-paid millennials. I don't mean billionaire millennials, but, you know, even for a well-paid millennial 
whose wage has gone up pretty effectively over the 10 years or 15 years since they came out of college, home prices went up faster. So it, I'm doing better, but it's getting farther away. It becomes a political strain. You got to do something. Now, as you suggest, the something will end up being more destructive than the problem, but it will happen. It will happen. And interestingly, the, um, and of course, what happens if you threaten rent controls? Am I going to build more apartments or fewer apartments? Right, fewer. F fewer, mm -hmm. right? Even if they don't get introduced, even if the rent controls don't get introduced, you know you're going to discourage somebody from building an apartment. And you've seen it in Seattle, you've seen it in Portland, you've seen it in Cap coastal California. Um, th those concerns have dampened. By the way, you don't see it in Houston. You don't see it in Dallas. You see different issues, but you don't see that. Why are homes very affordable in Houston and Dallas, even though the population in Houston and Dallas has grown far faster than the population of the Bay Area in, in California. It's not about demand, it's all about supply. Houston and Dallas make it very easy to build homes. They don't threaten rent controls, they don't have a lot of uh, fancy rules, they don't have a lot of fancy taxes, it's pretty easy to build. Um, not unsafe, just regular, you know, just easy process-wise and dollar-wise. California is the exact opposite. California prices are crazy. And yeah, I'm paid more in California than I am. And I'm paid twice as much in California as I am in Texas, but home prices are four times higher. Hmm. I'm not better off. And hence the rent control. Why don't we do something? Which will mean even less housing, which will make it even worse. No, I, have a, I have a question. Uh just mainly about, uh, you know, this redistribution of wealth uh, and, and back to kind of the inflation talk. Like, it, how can you explain to me if this is going to affect the overall value of the dollar or if this, like, in a sense, doesn't really affect it? <laughs> okay, that's a great question. You guys are clever. Um, um, it's a great question. The value of a dollar is clearly depreciating every year in terms of what it'll buy, right? So even if the inflation rate in the U.S. is only 2%, you have to have 102 next year to buy the same things you bought for 100 this year. So that's devaluing the dollar. But I don't think that's what you have in mind. What you mean is versus the euro or versus the yen or versus the U.S., okay? Well, think about what's happening. The dollar getting weaker or stronger is, yep, we're devaluing our currency compared to last year, but so is Europe. Yeah. So is China. So is every place else. And so the value of the dollar depends on how fast you erode your value compared to how fast they erode their value. So if, if, if it only costs us 2% more and it costs them 5% more, we strengthen. Hmm. Even though, it, by the way, again, you say you have a health orientation on this. Uh, I am in much worse physical condition at the age of 70 than I was when I was 20. However, compared to other 70-year-olds, I'm in massively better shape compared to my peers today than I was when I was 20. And I was in decent shape. I played a little intercollegiate ball, but, you know, there were studs. There were real studs. Um, today, just being in any kind of shape puts me in the top half a percent of 70-year-olds, right? right? So it's similar to that. So if I came back to your question, I would say that the world – is in a race to devalue itself. Hmm. And as a result, in an odd way, we probably get stronger wow. relatively, even though we're weaker in an absolute sense. 
Right, but that's did, interesting. But but will this uh, negatively affect uh, investment or the allocation of uh, you know resources into because the market signals are getting a little bit skewed, right? Because of all of this in, in, intervention. So, what are the consequences of of the world devaluing its currency? Does it result in less innovation? Does it result in malinvestment? All the I above. think it really means that the U.S. gets even more money cheaply from abroad. So when I was your age, foreigners provided, I don't know, 10% of the U.S. debt, government debt. Today, they provide about 50% of it, five zero. Why? Because kind of what you're saying, and I'll do a little quiz. How many of you would rather be investing your money in Uzbekistan right now? Right. I don't think so. How many? And by the way, if you're an Uzbekistani, would you try to get your money out of Uzbekistan and the world as crazy as it is today and into the U.S.? Even if the U.S. is getting worse? You, of course. And what about Kenya? I have a big charity effort in Kenya, my wife and I do. And I can tell you, they're trying to get their money here, not there. Because if you think it's tough here, it's really tough there, and it could truly get stolen. How about China? You want to have your money? How many of you have sent a lot of money to China in the last month? How many of you woke up today saying, yep? How many of your listeners woke up saying, yep, I need to invest more money in China? I know a whole lot fewer than Chinese that woke up today saying, damn, we get more and more authoritarian. I have no influence on it. They take on Jack Ma very publicly. They take on um, a, a Lai. I'm not maybe mispronouncing his name in Hong Kong. What are they, they're not going to think twice about me if they're going to take on Jack Ma. I think if I could get my money in the U.S. So what it means, if you go around the world, Saudi Arabia, would you rather have your money in Saudi Arabia now or in the U.S. now? And given all the things that are going on. And so, as odd as it may seem, we're getting more money from these places because even though we're not wonderful, um, relatively are. I'll take a good example. You guys remember Madoff. Madoff stole real money, right? Mm -hmm. That's a normal occurrence in lots of countries. Here... It's a rare event, right? It's a rare event. I'm not trying to, but here we're shocked that somebody had a massive Ponzi scheme. In Romania, they're not shocked. In Saudi Arabia, it's not a, a Ponzi scheme. It's the government. Remember when um, the prince imprisoned in the, what was it, the Ritz-Carlton or the Four Seasons Hotel uh, four or five, four years ago, um, 70 of the wealthiest until he extracted the money he wanted, mm -hmm. right? Does that make you want to have your money in Saudi Arabia or here? So things like Madoff occur here. Horrible things occur here. Stupid court decisions occur here. People steal here. They do it professionally and daily in these other places, and that's the best thing we have going for us. So it actually will help our productivity in a perverse way. Okay. Now, going back to you know the comment you made about the Great Depression and how had we loosened the money supply, we made if we might have put ourselves in a recession. And so that apply that to what happened in two thousand eight. We loosened the money supply, uh, and some people would argue that prevented a depression. We were in a recession. Lots of other people were saying this is never going to end. They're going to continue to kick the can down the road until we and, and we're going to blow this thing up until the correction is so big uh, that there's nothing that we can do. What do you say to those people? What do you say to people who say, "Look, here's the deal. You're right. We would have had more harsh consequences in 2008, but what we've done now is we've just put ourselves on the cycle of printing." And at some point, the you know it's going to be wor It's going to be far worse. We're going to have way more pain because we've we've increased malinvestment because we've inflated the money supply so much, and it's no. There's it's not going to stop. So I have two answers. I'm a healthy seventy, and I think my life expectancy as a healthy male, 
age 70 is to what? 86 or something like that. Does that sound about right? Yeah. So as long as it happens 16 years from now, I don't give a damn. <laughs> right, you guys can sort it out. You guys can sort it Piss out. Piss on just you. Piss on you, Peter. <laughs> Good luck. Yeah. Just, keep, just keep kicking it for another, you know. So I'm joking, but you get the point. Um, interestingly, you could, we can kick the can down the road. I don't know if we can do it infinitely, but we can do it a long time. Um, if we're willing to deal with those distortions like you were talking about, rent controls, social concern about, gee, how did those people suddenly end up a whole lot, just a whole lot richer? Just think of what we saw in the stock market in the last, what, year? Mm -hmm. How did those people end up a whole lot richer? I'm not richer, is what some people are saying, right? That didn't have any assets. So the people without assets are saying, how did they get richer? And I didn't get richer. That can't be fair, right? And I'm not even going to say what is fair, but that's a social thing you got to deal with that has political ramifications. If As long as we can deal with those social and political, whatever you want to call them, we can keep kicking the can down the road as long as we're better than everybody else. So Europe has been kicking the can down much more than we have, you know, Italy, right, Greece, uh, et cetera. They've been kicking the can much more than us. Um, uh, and, And many other countries. So we can kick it down the road as long as where else you're going to go is true and as long as you're willing to deal with all these social fabric issues that arise. Remember, there are always social fabric issues. So we have all the normal social fabric issues plus the social fabric issues created by this. Yeah, because you, you'll look at like statistics and it'll show over the last you know 20 years, the, you know, this top quadrant of the economy increased their wealth by this ridiculous amount and the bottom didn't at all or very, very little. And some of that is due to, you know, what you're talking about with this, where, where, you know, people at the top, they they have a lot of the money tied up in investments and they see this and they can invest in things seeing that the prices are going to go up. One of the challenges I tend to have with people oftentimes is, and this is, I think, and I'd love to ask you about this, is we don't know what would have happened. And what I mean by that, I'll give you an example where, Mm -hmm. you know, let's say a, a city raises their minimum wage, they pass a law, it goes up by $5. And then at the end of the year, they do a study and they say, hey, look, we added 500 jobs. So there you go. It didn't hurt uh, any jobs. But what we don't know is how many jobs would have been added had they not done that in the first place. Um, Could we have potentially seen prices drop in goods and services? We're seeing some inflation, but would we have seen maybe deflation? And, and, And is deflation bad? I've heard economists talk about deflation as a bad thing. But it's always confusing to me. Like, isn't the price of things going down a good thing? Uh, depends which side of the desk you're on, right? If I'm a buyer, price is going down is a great thing. So I like hotel prices, not prices, hotel room rates going down as a room rate person. The problem is for the hotelier, their income's gone down. That means they may not have enough money to pay their taxes to pay their debt, to pay their lenders, their employees. Oh, that's a problem. So as long as those things are kind of in balance, eh, right? When they get way out of balance, it can be a disaster. And we saw it with way out of disaster, way out of balance on price drops can be a real disaster. Um, It's not like in Inflation is a good thing. It is a good thing to some people and a bad thing to others. And it just depends on who you are, where you are in the economy. It's very interesting. People haven't really focused on this. You know, you correctly make the comment about wealth going up for those that owned assets. That's It's interestingly less, quote, the top 10% or 2% or whatever. It's if you owned assets. Right it went up, right? Um, 
Interestingly, the people who never had assets, think about what happened during COVID, just as a real example. Um, if you were living in public housing and you were living on food stamps and you were living on various government programs and you weren't employed, and I'm not making any judgment, your income was unchanged, right? You literally had no change in your status, economic status, right? Through one of the most uh, crazy times ever, you went through unaffected. By the way, a lot of retirees went through unaffected. So security and their you know pension plans, they just kept paying them. They went through unaffected, some of them. Others got clobbered, right? Young employees got clobbered if you were cleaning rooms at home. So the impacts across people of big changes are hard to predict. And so by not letting the economy fall apart, which is probably what we did during the financial crisis by injecting some amount of that money. I don't know if we need it at all. I've on record saying we didn't need it all. We went too far, but we'll never know. And again, this time, I think we injected too much, but we'll never know if it was too much or not. We'll never know. Um, why do I think it's too much? It's all these social stresses that it creates that I worry about by too much, right? And um, why is the social that then translate into political, et cetera, the rent controls being a great example. I'll give you another example that I worry about. I worry about um, why don't we reduce the typical down payment from 10 or 20% to 2%, right? And when things get very unaffordable, you start hearing that again. And why don't we have Freddie and Fannie, the government agencies, be required to do one and two percent mortgages, but one or two percent down right. mortgages? That can't be smart. That can't be smart to say I'm going to give somebody a three hundred thousand dollar asset, and all they have to come up with is three thousand. That can't be. I mean, it just doesn't make intuitive sense. Well, that's part of what led to the problem. And with OE. I don't know. And that's what led to the, well, actually, 2002, 2002 to 06, which then yeah. uh, manifested in 08, 09. Yeah. Yes. Now, in, in the in the late 70s, we saw uh, inflation going up quite a bit, some huge numbers. And the way that they f tried to fix it was by dramatically increasing interest rates. Is that still a tool that they could use today if things start to get a little bit too hot? Can they raise okay. interest rates, and what would that look like? Okay, do you know how they really first tried to stop inflation no. back then? Under a Republican administration, um, they had a wage and price control board. A wage and price control board. We weren't the only country. Many of these were put up in many countries, Israel and, and, and down in Brazil and Argentina, all around the world. Wage and price controls. Literally, government agencies that were micromanaging wages and prices, if you were going to raise the price of certain things, you had to go to the government. And in fact, wow. Gerald Ford, who was a Republican president, went during one of his addresses to the nation, I think it was in 70. Five, could have been in early 76, went on with a little button that said win. White letter, you know, the kind of campaign buttons or smiley yeah. face button, that kind of button. He had that kind of button on that said win. Whip inflation now <laughs> with wage and price controls. And of course, too much money created all these social stresses. By the way, by 1974, five, six, huge lines just to buy gasoline. Just to buy gasoline. Go on and Google search gasoline lines. My wife and I, I was in graduate school. We had a tiny little apartment and we looked out at a gas station. And there would be a two hour line there every day because you were only allowed to buy like four gallons because they were rationing. 
-hmm. and they were keeping the price artificially low. If you were to drive from Chicago to Ohio, you had to carefully plan and you would then have to stop probably three times to not fill your tank, but to, you know, get, it was crazy. So that was the first way they tried to do it. Then finally in 81, Paul Volcker uh, was, became the new Fed chairman and said, we just got to make it more expensive to get access to money for borrowers. And the interest rate went way up. Borrowers suddenly stopped borrowing as much. And whether they were consumer borrowers or business borrowers, and that effectively started dampening inflation. That's what really happened. And including, by the way, the government. It's not per chance that when interest rates went up in the early 80s, late 70s, early 80s, it's not per chance that the government had to face, we can't buy everything we want because money isn't free. We got to tax them. And taxing is a harder thing to do than printing money. Right. So, so do you think that they would do that now, that they would raise interest rates now? Or do you think that they're like, that's... That's a hard thing to, to pass, so let's just keep printing. If you really made me guess, we're not going to have much consumer inflation over the next four years. We are going to have a lot of asset inflation, especially three and four years from now. It takes a little while for that money to come out. It would not shock me. Remember, I said, it was a Republican administration that introduced wage and price controls. If we started to see what we're seeing now, like lumber and some of these other items where the prices are running, really running, mm -hmm. it wouldn't surprise me at all that the government agents creates an agency to mandate prices on select essential items. Because if the Republicans did it in the 70s, I don't find it hard to believe the Democrats would do it in 2020s intellectually. I don't find that hard to believe. And of course, what they'd say, we're only going to do it temporarily. We're only going to do it on essential things. And we're only going to do it where we think people are being gouged, right? That's the slope. So I wouldn't be shocked if late this year, early next year, I don't think it'll happen, but I wouldn't be shocked if it would, that you start seeing freezes, that's how it starts, put on certain items. So, and what's really happening is very simple. What's really happening on those prices, look, I'm on corporate boards. I advise corporate boards. I advise. And I can tell you in March 2020, April, May, June of 2020, every uh, board of it, worth their merit or every executive worth their merit said shrink capacity. Otherwise we're going to get crushed and we're going to have to go out of business. Shrink capacity, freeze all expansion of capacity, wow. especially in cyclical businesses like auto and, and airline and um, housing and these cyclical businesses, you sat there going, well, if it was bad, then and it was bad then and if it was bad then it's going to be horrible now because normally at the start of a downturn you don't even know it's a downturn yet right you don't really know it's a downturn until you're in it four five six eight months by trust me last year everybody you didn't have to be a genius to sit there by the end of march last year early april saying this is not going to be good in the near term and so they, they reduced capacity by 10 to 40%. That meant capacity went to levels of something like 2000, year 2000 or year 2010. What do you think happens if capacity got slashed so those businesses didn't go out of business? And let's just take you're at 2000, year 2000 capacity. And demand suddenly grows back to 2020, excuse me, to 2019 demand. Oh. Prices are going to go through the ceiling. Yeah. So, And that's what's happening, not everywhere, but in select places. And those select places make things very challenging. 
Now, what will happen? You know capacity will come back on, just a matter of when. In the meantime, they're making a lot of money and saying, well, I don't want to expand my capacity because nobody can steal my customers anyway. But you know it's only until next week somebody's going to say, I got a better idea. I'm going to keep prices up to my customers. I'm going to expand my capacity a little bit and steal their customers. Mm-hmm. And that will start the process. But it'll take six to 24 months for that to unwind. And during that period, it is possible we would get price controls of some type Ugh. in so, key areas. So, I hope I'm wrong. I hope I'm wrong. So let's yeah. send I mean, real estate is your is your expertise. So I, I like to speculate with you. What what do you think is going to happen in multifamily, single family, commercial over the next you know, 12, 12 plus months. What are we going to see over the next couple of years in those areas? What's your prediction? Um, by and large, good thing, like hotels. The supply is shrunk by about 10%, right? So a bunch of hotels just went out of business or were shuttered. So I'm going to do it nationally. 10% reduction in hotel supply. And I think by the end of next year, with the possible exception of international travel, demand will be back to 2019. So you're going to have 2019 demand with 10% lower capacity. That's a great time for the hotel sector, right? Doesn't take a genius to figure that out. Um, Office, I think what happens is that the next year is challenging, but people are going to come back to work. Right now, they're under no competitive disadvantage, not going to work, working virtually. But once somebody starts coming back to work, the competitive pressure picks up. It's like the difference between a shooting around before a game and having real defenders. It's a whole different thing. And I said to somebody the other day who has two children and was complaining to me about how awful virtual schooling is, and I believe it is, was complaining to me about what a disaster it is for their kids. And then he said to me, separate conversation, he says, I don't think people are going to go back to the office. And I said, what makes you believe that work productivity isn't just as adversely affected as school productivity is by virtual And he stopped in his tracks and he said, I never thought of it that way. I said, of course, how do you build a culture? You know, you can do this session with me because you're not trying to build a culture around the four of us. You've got the culture of the three of you and I just jump in, right? And if I'm an asshole, you deal with it, right? And if I'm in your culture, you deal with it. But uh, you know, it's very hard to build a culture and to, to grow a company. So office people will come back, but it will take a little time. And you'll see um, improvement, although the supply has not shrunk much. So there, the supply is still about 2019 levels. And it'll take a couple of years for demand to get back to 2019 levels. Um, industrial properties, warehouses, the supply cannot keep up with the demand. This was true before um, uh, COVID because um, this is roughly, if you bought that shirt online and let's say it took one square foot of warehouse space to deal with you buying that, uh, uh, let's say it took three square feet in a warehouse to deal with that selling to you online, It only takes one foot if you buy it in a store, one foot. So it's a three to one. Well, now if you have online growing fast and it's a three to one factor, not a one to one factor, it's very hard to overbuild it. So what happened in warehouse is the supply demand fundamentals are, gee, we're going to build 2%. Surely that'll take care of the demand in 2017. Demand grew by 5%. Rents went up. Then in 18, same thing. They went up to 2.5% new supply. Demand grew by 4.5%. Rents went up. Same thing in 19. Rents went up. Rents went up. They 
fundamentals there. So I think rents and warehouses keep going up even as they build more and more because people don't understand this three to one phenomenon. The people in particular that don't understand it are lenders. Um, what did I forget? Apartments. Apartments, solid, solid. The biggest run of people getting instant down payment money will be over by the end of this year. Why do I say that? Because as we go back to the ball games, as you go back on holidays, as you go back out to eat, that savings disappears that we were talking about, goes back down to 7%. So people don't have this massive down payment capacity. And by the way, people over 70 are done dying abnormally fast. They're dying, but not abnormally fast. So that other phenomenon I was talking about is gone. It's not completely gone because it takes a few months to settle in the state. So this year still has some of that. So um, multifamily will do fine. Um, multifamily will do just fine. A lot of capital chasing it. And single family will do well the rest of this year. But I actually look for it to slow as we go to next year because of this down payment phenomena and this affordability phenomena. That this flood of down payment money availability will be gone. And now we're going to be just facing people saying, oh, my God, uh, how do I afford it? You know, I don't have a down payment. Everybody who had a down payment's already done it. So now you're into those who don't have a down payment. So it becomes more of a challenge, single family. So I think it softens a bit. Do they cover everything that way? More yeah. or less. Senior housing has a serious problem. It's two problems. One is people can't do math. Um, basically, people don't start moving into senior housing until they're 78 to 80. There are exceptions, but in big way. And so people keep saying, that the baby boom, the baby boom, the baby boom. Well, the baby boom's not going to be 78 to 80 for another five to seven years, the front edge of it. And in fact, the people who are the right age to move into senior housing were the ones born during World War II. And there weren't as many because 43% of the American males were in the military during World War II. By the way, I was just looking, there were 300,000 births in Great Britain to American servicemen during the war. 300,000. Wow. Wow. I mean, those were births that could have happened here. So they might have a surge in England, but not here. We weren't here. <laughs> so the second problem they have, I think they'll solve, is this data I've seen shows that only about 60%, 60 percent, six zero percent of caregivers are getting vaccinated. And you could say that's good or bad and personal freedom and all that. Do you really want your grandma, even if she's been vaccinated, around a bunch of caregivers who aren't vaccinated? And yeah, I read the press and it's 90 whatever, 97 percent effective. You want grandma to not only be effective, but you want everybody around her to be effective. And so far they have not mandated that caregivers get vaccinated. University of Pennsylvania, which is a large medical system, not senior care, just announced this week that they're gonna require all, all employees to get vaccinated. They make them get flu shots. So they're gonna require them to get vaccinated. We'll see how that goes. But if you're a senior care owner, that is a problem of are you looking to put grandma in a place where you think 40% of the caregivers aren't vaccinated? I don't know. Peter, I That's a challenge. Peter, I want to go back to the, the single family homes because uh, historically, uh, the vast majority of single family homes were purchased by you know people wanting to live in these houses, right? People who have families. But from what I've yep. been, from what I've been reading, it looks like more and more you're seeing these investment groups, which historically would buy multifamily, you know, apartment complexes, duplexes. 
more and more they're recognizing this opportunity with single family homes and they're buying multiple uh, single family homes as investments. You see them doing this with like Airbnb uh, where they're renting them out in that yep. way. Do you see that continuing to grow uh, and, and what kind of impact will, do you think that'll have? I think it will grow, but the, mainly because I'm doing this from memory. There's something like 16 million single family homes that are rented out and the big guys, you know, the kind of um, invitation homes, American home for rent, etc. cetera. They're only some number like 2 million of those. And I think what will happen is it just keeps professionalizing. It's always been there. You know, your uncle Phil owned two homes that he rented out, right? And your aunt Selma, bought one, fixed it up, she rented it out. Or your grandmother died and you inherited it and rather than selling it, you've been renting it out, right? So it's always been there. And I think largely what has happened, largely, is institutionalization and professionalization of more and more of them. They're buying the home that your Uncle Phil had or the six homes that your Uncle Phil had. The economics are very interesting in that basically, if you buy one or two homes, you deal with it with the back of the pickup truck, you don't get audited financials, you just keep your own little quick book um, and so forth, you, you almost have to make money. You just almost have to make money. It's hard not to make money if you do one or two or four, six. When it's hard is... When you take institutional money, and maybe you have 300 of them or 500 of them, because now I have to get audited by a big firm. And now I've got to have a Wharton MBA get reports to those investors. Well, that overhead becomes crushing, just becomes crushing. If I got big enough, if you have 3,000 homes, 4,000 homes, you can spread that overhead. And it works again. So it's this very odd phenomena where you can almost have to make money very small and you have to make money very large. And so the big guys just try to get bigger to spread the overhead and to reduce the financing costs. Um, there is another niche people are playing, and that is um, we own some land and um, – if I said I have a, enough land for 300 homes, single family homes to be purchased, and you ask me in a typical market, that takes five years to sell. 60 homes a year is a big velocity. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a big velocity. That's 15 homes a week. Uh, that, that you're, you're kicking along, right? On the other hand, if I said rent up 300 apartments, You'll do that in uh, 10 months. And so there is a bit of an arbitrage that if I rent homes, I can lease them up with an apartment renter speed, but I buy the land as if it's got a low velocity of single family. So there's a bit of an arbitrage there. But it's a nice little niche, and it's a good big niche and it's a pain in the ass in between. We got up to about 330 homes, and the overhead just kills you. Mm -hmm. Just kills you. Peter, I have, I have an invest another investment question for you. So let's, we're going to create two avatars, and I would love your advice for these mm -hmm. two people. Uh, let's say you're, you have $100,000 saved, knowing what we know about the next you know five to 10 years. What would you do with that money? And then let's talk about another avatar. You're a wage earner, you're saving a little bit of money, but you pretty much, you know, live no assets. Paycheck to paycheck. You don't own any assets. What does that person do knowing what we know, you know, moving forward? So those two people, what, okay. what should they so do? So I would take I've got a new book coming out at the end of the year. National Geographic is the publisher with the, and I it's an odd combination of Albert Radner, who's ninety one, and Mike Royzen, who's head of 
uh, wellness at Cleveland Clinic and me. Who would? And we got this book about living a long time. And um, my advice to the latter, namely, you make a living, you have a job, you will earn a bit more three years from now than you do today. You'll earn, earn a bit more, excuse me, 10 years from now than you will three years from now. If I were to say, do move heaven and earth and save 5% a year, save 5% a year, what do you put it in? I'm not promoting Vanguard, but put it in something like a Vanguard index fund, State Street, and you know, a, a no load index fund and forget about it. You know, just put it in there. And if you can do it through a retirement, like a um, 401k or an IRA, even better. And just put it in there. Don't sell it. Don't trade it. Don't look. Just put your 5% a year. And by the way, if you can figure out how to do 7% a year, even better. Just put it in. Move heaven and hell to do it. Um. That's my advice to them, which is, I don't know if it's a great time now to invest. I don't know if it's a bad time now to invest. But I know that over a long term, there'll be more good times than bad with hindsight to have invested. And just do that. Don't try to be sophisticated. The biggest mistake, I think that one of the biggest mistakes we all make in life is thinking we know things we don't know. If you be, It's one thing to not know stuff. But if you act on stuff you don't know, uh, it kills you. Like my friend, the English teacher, who thought she knew how stocks would move in the future, had no idea. She's an English teacher. Why did you sell at the bottom? Why did you never go back in? If she would have just left it untouched, she'd have been all right. Mm -hmm. She'd have been all right. She was her own worst enemy. And I'm not picking on her. I'm just using her example. So for normal people, and I come from normal people. I mean, my father didn't graduate from high school. My mother graduated from high school. My father was a laborer at Standard Oil of Ohio um, and then worked for the local little city government in a, a clerk kind of job. Um, uh, my mother worked in a little perfume store counter. So I know what real people are. I was a real person. I remember when we were on food stamps and so forth. Um, don't try to outthink things. Simple, 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 safe, safe, safe. Um, if I had the avatar that has more assets, more resources, I would say um, pretty much the same, though I would then have a little REIT portfolio probably. Mm you know, and maybe a little gold uh, from a diverse, I'm not a gold bug, but the little gold, and I'd avoid Bitcoin. <laughs> and the reason I'd avoid Bitcoin is, and I don't mean this the way it'll stop, if I can't figure it out, how the hell can most of the people figure <laughs> it out? And if Elon Musk thought he had it figured out one week and then three days later said, oops, I was wrong, it just says it's not easy to figure out. And if people get really rich off of Bitcoin, God bless. You know, God bless. It's hard to think of an avatar that that fits, you know, and unless there's a the obvious and they're all starting to tumble to it. I've been saying to friends that Bitcoin, it's drug money. It's crime syndicate money. It's guys who refuse to pay taxes. It's people hiding money from their spouses in a divorce. It's all that kind of crap. And it's the perfect me mechanism. By the way, I saw something that they believe twice the amount of money was used for illegal purposes, like ransoms, as was used to actually buy stuff. With cryptocurrency last year. That says a lot. <laughs> Do you want to be in an item where it's largely being used to ransom people, launder drug money? You know, I don't think so. That's not for the little old lady from Pasadena, even if she has a lot of money. 
So I would not go on a shell, though. I would not go on a shell. Okay. So what I keep hearing from you is if you've got some money, uh, you said REITs, uh, which is investments in, in property, that right, yeah. right now property is probably a pretty good bet because the prices are probably going to keep going up because supply's low, it's getting lower, interest rates are low. It doesn't sound like you think they're going to raise them anytime soon. So it's probably a good time to keep buying property. But uh, is this going to be a bubble at some point? Or are we going to see a large correction? How I mean, how far can they keep going? So first of all, it could drop the day after you bought. Okay? And all you have to do is look at the last 20-year history of it, right? It could drop the day after you buy. But if you hold it 7, 10 years, that is, don't look at it. You'll do okay. Just don't look at it. Um, you'll do okay. Now, buy quality, right? Don't buy crap. Don't go into the worst companies. Go into the better companies. Uh, try to buy the better real estate. Good things tend to happen to good real estate. Um, but and, and good things tend to happen to well-managed companies. That doesn't mean bad things never happen to good companies. And bad things happen to good real estate sometimes. But I would skew to quality. I would do it and and be patient. Um, and yep, it's going to go up and down. It's going to be horrible. You're going to pull your hair out. And yet, 10 years later, 20 years later, you're going to be fine. And we've studied that. I've done research. We wrote it up in Lineman Letter. Actually, we're bringing it back out in the upcoming issue of Lineman Letter of of returns over a 10 year hold, how they did. And, and, you know, you do okay. You don't keep become a billionaire, but you do okay. If you want to become a billionaire, uh, overnight, play the lotto. All right, Peter, before one last question, and then we'll let you go. I, I appreciate your, your level headedness. It's been a great conversation. I hope we do this again. Uh, before we go, though, uh, any books you recommend? What are some of your favorite books? Okay, so it's funny. I have a book club for my Kenya kids. We support a lot, a lot of orphans, all every every element of their life: clothes, food, et cetera, et cetera, school. It's you know, you name it. We have them going from I think our youngest is seven, and we have one getting his ma his PhD, excuse me, at the University of Georgia. Um, in, in the U.S. So we have everything in between. So you can imagine for the older ones, I've tried to get them to expand their minds. So I'm going to give you a couple from that. But the reason I stress them is I think they're formative items for thinking. Okay. And you mentioned one of them, which is Milton Friedman's Free to Choose. Yep. You may love it. Or by the way, it's also was a video series. So you could do the, the video series is, as you might imagine, not quite as nuanced in its argument, but it's the same arguments made very well by Milton Friedman. So either the book or the video series, I think you can get the video on YouTube. It's there. That's yeah. where I've seen it. It's so, free on YouTube. Yeah. So I would say um, free to choose. Now, you may hate it, but you'll learn the argument for real. You may love it. And I mean, but... It is a brilliant, it's just a brilliant statement in my mind. Second is a book, um, I think it's by Nicholas Ridley, called The Rational Optimist. And it's probably about six years ago, a brilliant book that basically says that the world is getting better, is getting better in fits and starts all of its history, and for example, the Sun King, Louis the Fourteenth of France, none of us would want to live like Louis the Fourteenth, mm -hmm. even though he lived more opulently than anyone in history. But they didn't know how to do antibiotics. So if he cut himself, there was a good chance he was going to die of an infection. Just to, they didn't have indoor plumbing, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Right? We would never want to live that way. So I'd say the rational optimist. I would say there's a book by Hans Rosling, who passed away just after he finished the book, 
called uh, factfulness. Factfulness. I'm not even sure it's a real word, but factfulness, in which he makes an important argument about, again, how the world is improving, though in fits and starts, and how all of us are captured by the world as it existed at the time we learned about it. So we freeze in our mind how many girls finish high school in the world at the time you were in high school or college when you learned it. And then you come back 20 years later, in my case, many more than 20 years, is radically different. And he, it's, a, it's a wonderful book. Um, he has, again on YouTube, there's a Hans Rosling, brilliant, um, it's probably about eight minutes, seven minute video of um, like the economic history of the world in five minutes or whatever it is. I encourage people to see it. Now, it's a little dated. It's about six years old or whatever. So it's not updated, but you'll get the theme. And it's brilliantly done. Those would be, and I'll tell you another book. You'll laugh at this. Um, I never read Robinson Crusoe. Never read Robinson Crusoe. So I have essentially a German grandson who's 12, and we read books, and he chooses one, and it's invariably you know, some fantasy like Harry Potter or, you know, people are half, half animals or, and, and so we read. And, and then when I pick you, it's Treasure Island, Three Muskets. So I'm doing these kind of classic. Well, I had never read Robinson Crusoe, which is written in 1719. And it's very interesting in a couple of ways. One, you realize it wasn't written for children. There was no audience for children's books. So you realize that's how you wrote for adults back then. For if you wanted a big seller as an adult, that's what the level of reading and storytelling was, uh, other than religious. So that's one. And the other is, it's a fascinating story of what the hell would I have done? How would I have done? The guy was a slave at one point and owned slaves at another point, And he thought nothing about the incongruity, that was life in 1719. And so it's useful for us to get out of our shell and understand how the world has changed. And on top of it, it's a ripping good story. So if I said for fun, I would read that. And the last set I would do is if for fun, you've never read John Le Carre, who died, what, four months ago, five months ago, the great... A mystery writer. If you've never read the Smiley trilogy, read them. They're they're great fun as well. So I kind of go on the gamut in that regard. No, awesome, Peter. This has been great. I'd like to add two things. Uh, humanprogress.org is a great website. Uh, very similar along the lines of yep. factfulness and some of the other books where you can read about the progress that we've made in the world uh, with literacy and medicine and innovation. It's really phenomenal. And then if you want to see a really short Milton Friedman video, because um, Friedman chooses a long series, just watch him talk about the pencil. All you got to do is type in Milton Friedman, yeah. the pencil, and you'll kind of get the, the, you get the gift of, you know, figure out what kind of what he talks about a little bit and see if you want to keep going any further. Um, I'll just do one more. I uh, do one more. I started our, my, our charity effort in Kenya in very early 2003. At that time, we went over as tourists, right, and um, did, and I said, well, these animals are great, but what about, you know, what about people, and what about education, because education matters a lot to me, and at that time, in 2003, there was no mandatory education in the country of Kenya, literally, no mandatory education. Now, today, it's not perfect education, it's not wonderful, but what was that 18 years later, you know, there is mandatory education, at least up to age 12. You may say they should do more, but, and there are more schools and it's not wonderful. The world evolves. So your, your progress, um, maybe, maybe not perfect progress, but it's progress. Yeah. Well, thanks again, Peter. This has been a great interview. Thank you yes. very much. 
My pleasure, and enjoy Uzbekistan when you go. <laughs> Much appreciated. We'll plan it out. If you find yourself in this state where you're like, I'm kind of losing motivation, I'm losing a little bit of steam, is to change your goals. It's not just changing your goals. I want to be very clear. That's part of it, right? It's your it's, mindset. The mindset's the important thing. Let mm -hmm. me tell you, that is the hardest part of this whole conversation yes. because the, the inevitable 